Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon to the third event in the Nonfiction at Brown exclamation point public lecture series. Okay. <laughs> third event. Okay. Yeah, so it's the fifth year of the alumni forum that Catherine Imbrilio has organized for us of graduates who have taken nonfiction writing courses and have gone on to become famous, if not necessarily yet rich. <laughs> but <laughs> they have carved out lives for themselves and readership, and we are really proud of you. Um, and Catherine is the director of the honors program in the nonfiction writing program. So she knows these people well, and she knows many of you well as well. So um, I guess that's all we have to say, basically. We're hoping for sixth and seventh and continuing the forum. Hopefully. Hopefully. We'll, we'll yeah. see, yes. So, all oh, right, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, I put this one on too. All right, so um, I'm going to introduce these folks and then I'm going to ask them to read for about five minutes uh, from works in progress or works have just been published, um, and then we'll open up for questions. So I'm going to introduce to my right Sarah Cook, who was um, one of the honors um, nonfiction thesis writers two years ago. Um, I, I'm trying to remember where you were. You're in, you're in D.C. <laughs> yes. for and working at the one of the Washington Studio Theater. Studio theater. Um, and um, okay, that's, that's okay. That's, <laughs> um, that's I, I want to say It's yeah. very not rich or famous. <laughs> you, she will be. Um, cut a wood. <laughs> so, so the two bookends here are the youngsters, um, the and um, we have an interesting mix because we've got two people who are just out for about two years, and then we have people who are out for 13 years, I think, now, the two folks in the middle. Both of them have books. This is Cutter Wood, who also did his senior thesis uh, in the nonfiction writing program. He did a graphic nonfiction uh, essay um, and won the Casey Scherer Award uh, for that when he was an undergraduate. Um, Which was lovely. Many years ago. <laughs> and then uh, Jessica Weisberg, who um, actually w is, has a degree in comp lit. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also wanted to mention his book, which is uh, <laughs> Love and Death in the Sunshine State. just came out in, in 2018, right? Yep. Yep. And Jessica Weisberg has a bunch of things that she's done, um, but her m book uh, is called Asking for a Friend, and it has this long... Uh, subtitle, which, can you just tell us what it is? <laughs> <laughs> the subtitle um, is, I don't remember the subtitle, <laughs> it's uh, Three Centuries of Advice on Life, Love, Money, and Other Burning Questions from a Nation Obsessed. And it's a history of, um, of, of American advice givers throughout history. And it was uh, excerpted in, in the New Yorker, New York Review of Books, and I'm not remembering the last one. Um, let's see, is the Paris Review and Lit Hub. Great. Um, and then Lisa Borst, who also did um, a nonfiction honors thesis a couple years ago, uh, classmates, um, and these folks were classmates, right? Mm -hmm. um, and she uh, was working for the New Republic for a while and now is working for N plus one and is going to give us some N plus one gossip, I hope. Oh, <laughs> <any> gossip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask Sarah to to start uh, for about five minutes, we're just gonna read from work and give us a, just a little context of, of what it is that you're gonna read from, okay? Um, first just of all, a little background. Yeah, yeah sound okay. wise, are we good? Good sound wise, okay. Um, so like I said, I write grants, but I didn't bring a grant for you all because I figured <laughs> it wouldn't be as um, interesting or relevant. Um, so I'm working, I brought two works in progress uh, to share with you all today. One is a poem, the other is sort of a bit of a short prose piece. Um, in terms of content, I discuss mental illness and trauma and alcoholism, so at any point you need to step out, I completely understand. Uh, so the first one is a poem called No Thanks, I'm Good. Waking up in a tangle with somebody I love, past the time I needed to do my routine, to shake awake this loaned body, Pull skin up and down and against gravity so that I can be human for today. 
wanting more than this so I can be known by a force I can't control. Maybe the internet, a hashtag, an obsession. I don't want that, I want eggs, I tell him. Not even a quarter of a century and I catch myself so often thinking, yes, I would marry you. Not only would, but also want. How I want so much of this world, how I want it all to want me. Emptying the dishwasher as he makes the eggs. He's gentle with the shells, two cracks at most. Once I begged him to hit me, leave me, don't love me. I can't do that, he said. It was three in the morning and I was an animal. I thought that would be the end. Don't assume, a sharp-eyed woman reminds me and the group huddled in the therapy bunker. Every week we get another survival skill. Core mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotion regulation, interpersonal effectiveness. I put these sessions in my work Google calendar because sometimes I crave the fuck you of I'm crazy and could burn down the building. But no, I'm professional. <laughs> Breathe, I tell myself in Trader Joe's. The panic came with me and I can't get it to leave. Dumb question, but can I buy wine with a passport, I text him. Knowing the answer, yes, and hoping it's no. My mother told me stories of her uncles sprawled out with alcohol, all their pain lining up for inspection, their mangled rage fighting anything it could get its hands on. I don't drink because I hate myself enough to know I would love myself under its influence, wrathful and untouchable. Is it Pinot Grigio, I text him, knowing the answer doesn't matter because the recipe just needs 50 milliliters, a thumbnail. Those men, that pain. Ordering sparkling water at every chlorine-clotted college bar, apologizing everywhere, turning my eyes at work when the wine comes out and everyone is happy and I'm just there. Just pick the fucking Pinot because it's two buck chuck and I need to move on. I really need to move on. Um, do I have time? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, and the second piece is also a work in progress um, and it's sort of in response to Sheila Hetty's essay slash novel Motherhood and the other context for it is that I think quite obviously from that last poem, um, I've dealt with mental illness since I was a kid. And in August, I got diagnosed with a new thing um, called borderline personality disorder, which is actually what Pete Davidson has. Um, and that's how I found out I had it, because I was listening to an interview. And no, it's so true. I was listening to an interview with him and Mark Maron on Mark Maron's podcast. And I was like, wow, this sounds really familiar. So Pete Davidson, I owe a lot. Um, and so in August, I got that new diagnosis. And then a month later, I started dating somebody. Um, and he actually has bipolar disorder. and Bipolar and borderline are almost like two sides of the opposite coin. They both deal with um, issues of emotional regulation and sort of massive mood swings. Um, so the two of us are, are very intense weirdos, as we like to say. Um, so again, this is a work in progress, and it's just a prose piece. What would it be like to be married? I have no idea. We talk about it sometimes when we're watching cooking competition shows, squired under mounds of blankets and mugs of hot chocolate. Would you want that in our kitchen, I'll ask, pointing to some glorious island. In these shows, there is always a glorious island. Half joking, but only so that he can't see the full contours of my desire. I want that in our kitchen. I want so much in our kitchen. One of those perfect KitchenAid stand mixers dyed a brilliant yellow. Full windows on a window seat so I can curl up with their dog and a cookbook and spend a few hours there. Copper flatware, copper mixing tools, copper everything and a chrome espresso machine that hisses like it has a hit list. I think about our kitchen and think about what it would mean to come home to that and to him, and that life assembles before me in the surreal way of dreams, where simultaneously everything is possible and nothing feels wrong about believing that to be true. When I first met him, I felt as if I recognized him from somewhere, as if he had been significant to me in another timeline. He said the same thing. One morning, I watched his face as he slept, and in it, I saw so many things I know, so many things I will never know. Then I got out of bed and went to wash my face. I don't know if I want to be a mother. We talked about children in a diner once. We're both concerned about passing on our respective mental crap to a kid. I don't want to do that to somebody, he shrugged. I ate more of my sandwich. I don't know if I want to be a mother. The more I love Ben, the more I see how difficult it would be to give up the total pull I have over him and he over me. Difficult in the sense that borderline, when it's at a fever pitch, inflames me with the possibility that I might lose the person I love to somebody else. If we had a kid, would I get jealous? I can see myself storming out of the house, keys clenched, jaw set, self-righteous and impassable. 
You're choosing it over me, I might say. I chose you, I didn't choose half of you. I can also see myself raising the kid to be a badass, fierce and uncompromising, all energy always. I take the kid to martial arts class, then go to a boxing class, then join up with Ben for breakfast. We go to that diner and tell the kid, this is where we first talked about you, even though you weren't you then. The kid would groan and throw its hands over it. No, I'm sorry. You didn't tell me there was a timer. <laughs> <laughs> no, keep going. I'm sorry, I just have like Mariah Carey thoughts now. Um, Catherine, sorry, um, you're fine. The kid would groan and throw its hands over its face and the light would come through the window and I'd think to myself, you got better and you're getting better. Or the kid would be the thing I thought would save me and I'd pour myself into protecting the kid from harm. I'd become my mother, unraveled from myself, cut off from ambition. And I'd see that and blame the kid for what I wasn't able to work through. I'd find ways to hate the kid, just so I couldn't acknowledge it was myself that I hated. The kid might have borderline. The kid might have bipolar. The kid might have depression. Actually, it probably would. We're both fucked there. I was 10 when depression hit me. Is it fair to give those odds to a kid? Is it selfish to say it would be different since Ben and I know more than our parents did? Is it right to say we'd be different from our parents? The second time we had sex, the condom broke. We threw on our clothes and went to CVS to get plan B, where I apologized to rob the cashier and blushed and apologized, then apologized some more. Rob, sweet Rob, told me it was fine. Then he apologized. The American healthcare system is horrible to women, he said. Rob, I love you. <laughs> Afterwards, Ben bought me a tuna sandwich at our favorite cafe, and I wondered where we would eat if I had to get an abortion. That diner, probably. They have good French toast, sliced thick and crusted with powdered sugar, the way it's supposed to turn out, but only sometimes does. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 this is just per usual. So. Okay, now caught us on a read from his book, right? Uh, yeah, and sure. Give us a little. <laughs> <laughs> I won't, I'll try it's sitting here. Um, well, give us a little background on, you know, what you're reading. Sure. Um, so this is basically the, the story behind how I came to this book was I was down visiting some family. Can you all hear me all right, by the way? Down visiting some family in Florida, and I happened to stay at this little motel uh, on this island called Anna Maria on the Gulf Coast. And um, not long after I left, somebody set fire to it. And I thought, that's interesting. That's kind of strange. And so I went down, you know, I knew that there was this kind of, there was a disappearance behind this all as well. And I went down just kind of back down to see what was going on. And I was immediately struck by how much this community was affected by this woman's disappearance. You know, I was talking to her friends and, and people were like hallucinating seeing her everywhere on the street. Uh, you know, somebody thought they saw her at the dentist's office. Somebody thought, that saw, thought they saw her um, dressed in like a blue velour jumpsuit walking down the street in the middle of the night, uh, one woman told me that Sabina, this missing woman, was going to, uh, she was sure that she was going to reach out and get in contact via her pet parrot. And this one was like gonna contact me when that happened. So I just got very, you know, it was just kind of fascinating to see the way that we kind of filled this space where a person was with all of our strange hopes and fears and desires. So I thought I was going to write about that, and it, it turned out really to be a much darker and more involved story. Uh, really a lot about kind of the, essentially about the psychology of domestic violence. Um, but this bit I'm gonna read is very short. It just uh, describes the night that this fire happened at this motel when someone set fire to it. So, is that enough context, Catherine? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect, <laughs> perfect. Let me know when it's about to go off. I will. Listening, I wasn't Okay. The evening of the fire had been unusually cold, according to the article. I forgot to tell you, I first read about this in an article in the local paper, and that's kind of how I encountered this thing. The evening of the fire had been unusually cold, according to the article. There was a strong wind, and the sky was empty of clouds. As the sun began to drop into the gulf, the water turned bronze and a woman driving home didn't understand at first how the sun could be reflected so brightly in the, w in the windows of the motel. 
Only when she drew near did she realize it was flames. As happened sometimes at the lower latitudes, it was dark before anyone realized. And when the fire department arrived shortly after seven, one of the motel's buildings was wholly engulfed. The roof groaned, the palms crackled and swayed, the wind came in steady off the water, carrying smoke across the island, and for blocks around, the air had the sharp smell of melted plastic and polyester. Their gear clanking, a few firefighters walked the perimeter to assess the situation. While the rest began the work of unfurling the heavy hoses and loosening the hyd hydrant's caps. A crowd had already begun to form, couples out for a sunset stroll, retirees on their way home from an early dinner, children on bicycles and scooters with nothing better to do. Soon a car from the sheriff's office arrived and a thin deputy began asking the onlookers for their own safety to step back please and allow the crew to do its work. The rumor of arson always attends a fire and this was no exception. The crowd murmured and when a van pulled up from the local TV station it was clear the reporter had not come to tell a story about an accidental blaze. The deputy smoothed the air with his hands. This was a fire, nothing more and nothing less, and there was not yet any reason to believe it was a case of arson. But, he said, you did have to admit it was suspicious, considering the circumstances. The circumstances, in the most immediate sense, were a white 2000 Pontiac convertible. It belonged to one of the owners of the motel, a woman named Sabina Musel-Bueller and it currently sat in the sheriff's impound lot. It was not a particularly nice car, but it contained a good deal of blood, and this, combined with the fact that the woman had been missing for nearly two weeks, gave a certain amount of credence to the more macabre fantasies of the crowd. As the fire department began sending sprays of water onto the building's roof, an elderly woman still dressed in her pajamas declared that she was frightened and was leaving the island this instant, and for a long while after she continued to say this to anyone in earshot. It was hard not to stay around and skim the gossip. Who had set the fire after all, and more importantly, why? For a time, the onlookers pursued these questions, picking up the various theories, turning them this way and that, and putting them back down again. But it was a cold night for Florida, and windy, and getting late, and there are limits to what reasonable people can be expected to ask themselves after dark. A little past eight, the fire chief declared the blaze under control, and the people in ones and twos began picking out paths home along the puddled road. A whole town runs to be present at a fire, as Hazlitt notes, but the spectator hardly exults to see it extinguished. Um, a chapter towards the end of the book. Um, the book is, it's a historical book. Um, like the first chapter takes place in the 1600s and then the final section is contemporary advice givers. I'm going to read this chapter because um, I, I, if when I was in your position, I kind of wanted some practical advice about writing. And to get a book published, I had to publish a bunch of articles first. And uh, this is one of the articles that came out and was one of the reasons I got a book deal. Um, so I, I'm going to read part of that, and we can maybe talk about how that worked afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so the article is kind of long, so I'm going to just read this one section of it. And so here's the context you need. It's uh, a couple. Their names are Harville Hendricks and Helen Hunt, and they feel that they have the ability to give couples the tools that will allow them to stay together forever. And they think that if you've met someone and fallen in love, that... Um, they're, you should never break up. Like, they just don't believe in divorce. They've also both been divorced before. <laughs> um, so they're interesting people, and they, but they think they have the secret to making every marriage work. Um, and that interested me at a time when we have lived in a very fractured culture that they felt like they had the secret for everyone. And so I went with them to um, an event that they were putting on in Dallas. Um, and I'm just going to read you that scene. And that is all I'm going to read. Okay. 
220 people were in the audience, about half of them Hispanic. There was Spanish translation available, and the rest divided evenly between black and white. Most lived in the surrounding neighborhood, Oak Cliff, a largely working class Hispanic area. Volunteers in turquoise t-shirts roamed the room, handing out snacks and passing the microphone to people, and 22 clinical volunteers in navy t-shirts patrolled the workshop for couples in distress. On stage, Hendrix was trying to get a young couple to engage in a dialogue sequence. The pair sat in armchairs facing each other, and Hendrix told the man, Michael, to pay his wife of three months, Tara, a compliment. What I appreciate most about you is you're a good cook, Michael said. So what I'm hearing you saying is that you appreciate that I'm a good cook, Tara said. She seemed bored. <laughs> to prompt Michael, Hendrix began, when I think about you as a good cook, I feel... When I think about you as a good cook, Michael said, I feel full, sleepy, and sexy. Really, asked Tara, a little annoyed. The woman sitting next to me groaned. Hendrix jumped in. When I think about you as a good cook, it reminds me of, try, try to find something from your childhood. When I think about you as a good cook, I, Michael stopped, then started over. When the house smells good, it reminds me of home, and when my mom cooked, and I felt loved. Tara repeated him, her eyes now glassy with affection. Unprompted, she spoke the next line in the sequence. Is there anything more about that? There wasn't. They, <laughs> they hugged for 60 seconds as the rest of us watched. Hendrix told the crowd that the length of an average hug is three to nine seconds, but that a good hug, one that pushes the boundaries of relationship, takes a whole minute. <laughs> Hendrix has a trove of mysteriously sourced facts like this. He is dauntless in the way that sometimes comes with old age. Most of his information, he's in his 80s, I should say that. Sorry, you're coming in right in the middle of the article. Um, most of his information, he says, comes from research conducted either by him or by fellow Imago counselors of whom there are more than 100, 1,000 across the globe. He holds a PhD from the University of Chicago Divinity School and started to study relationships in the late 1970s, shortly after his own divorce. His ideas are inspired by physics, as well as sources ranging from Freud to the New Testament. There's a didactic structure of nature, he explained. Whenever a particle comes out of a void and into space, it comes with another particle. For all the grand theories of love, the workshop emphasized actions. During a segment dedicated to high energy fun, Hendrix and Hunt jumped up and down synchronously, breathing heavily until they burst into laughter. They say that regular belly laughs are a key to happy marriage, even if they're forced. They talk about laughter the way other people talk about vitamins. <laughs> As the day went on, people around me were conducting exercises and being driven to tears, revelations, and reconciliations. I talked to Daryl and Kayla Young, who had been married for 10 years. They'd been to a, the previous Dallas workshops and hoped to attend more. They'd become such adherents of Imago, that's the name of their methods, I should have said that. Then they, they've become such adherents of Imago that they plan to launch a petition to require a premarital course and exam for anyone in Dallas who wants a marriage license. You gotta take a test before you get your hunting license, license and your fishing license, Kayla said. Marriage is harder than fishing. <laughs> Hendrix and Hunt mainly cater to people who are married, but all varieties of couples are encouraged to come to the workshops. One couple in Dallas was a pair of sisters who sprinted through the every exercise and jumped up to give each other long hugs. Down the hall where free daycare was being offered, children of parents in the workshops were likewise learning a Mago dialogue, and I stopped in to watch. What I'm hearing you saying is that my bike was in the driveway and you hurt your leg, one second grader told another kid. Did I get that right? All right, so now Lisa. <laughs> that was really fun. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about what you are going to read. Sure. Um, I'm going to read a book review that I just wrote. Um, it was published in The Nation this week. Uh, it's a review of like a sort of a sci-fi novel. Um, I'm just going to start from the top, so I'll sort of give the t It's very like plot description heavy, um, which was kind of like something I needed to learn how to do. Um, but I tried to be fun about it. So. Um, the book is called Trump Sky Alpha. What is it? It's called Trump Sky Alpha. It's about Donald Trump. So also, sorry, it, like, this is going to be very Trumpy. so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it's also about the internet. Um, OK. Like many of the last century's most compelling dramas, the internet emerged out of anxieties about the bomb. An occasionally disputed history contends that plans for peer-to-peer -peer computing began in 1957, following the launch of Sputnik. Nervous about the Soviet Union's technological and especially nuclear capabilities, 
President Dwight Eisenhower and his advisors created the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, to oversee US defense technologies. In conjunction with university researchers and corporate R&D labs, ARPA was tasked with creating a computer network decentralized enough to withstand nuclear attack. In 1969, ARPA researchers transmitted their first successful message between two computers using an infrastructure called ARPANET. This network would become the internet. I don't like the way that sentence sounds. Um, Mark Doten's new novel, Trump Sky Alpha, is hyper attuned to this history, but it performs a, but performs a clever reversal of its inaugurating anxieties. In the novel, it's the collapse of the internet that triggers nuclear destruction rather than the other way around. Largely set in a post-apocalyptic near future, um, the novel's precipitating event is a mysterious four-day global shutdown of the web. In its sudden absence, a series of mostly unnamed violent conflicts erupt around the world, and by the time the internet flickers back on, a reactive President Trump is poised to enter the nuclear launch codes. The President narrates this decision in a blustering address that bookends the novel, delivered to the United States from the eponymous Trump Sky Alpha, an enormous Zeppelin that he pilots weekly between Trump Tower, the White House, and Mar-a-Lago. Un <laughs> unfolding in a rambling, Trumpian free and direct discourse, these sections set up the crisis that grounds the rest of the novel, and at the same time establish Doten as a virtuosic satirist. Doten, an editor at Soho Press and the author of a previous novel, The Infernal, has published ventriloquizations of Trump and his associates before. That's a hyperlink on the internet. Um, and he's mastered the craft. This is a Trump whose fascistic mannerisms are just slightly bloated from reality, but the prose maximizes and luxuriates in his repulsiveness. Doden assembles a perverse thing of beauty from the cruel theater of the presidency, finding in Trump's callous illogic and inflammatory syntax a surprising instrument for stylish and extremely funny sci-fi. In one scene, a group of Secret Service agents trying from the White House roof uh, to subdue the increasingly manic president, quote, plummet to their deaths like losers. <laughs> the bombs, when they fall, will be, quote, phenomenal, quote, terrific, quote, the most beautiful thing I've ever built, bones flecked in gold and wrapped up in all kinds of slashing golden light. When the catastrophe, when the catastrophe finally, finally comes, quote, the big event, the one we've been waiting for for the better part of a century, it feels like a natural end point to the Internet's 60-year history, the whole platform brought down by its most dumbly and viciously emblematic user. Um, I'll read the next section, too. Uh, in some ways, this premise supposes a cozily old school vision of apocalypse, one in which doomsday occurs with satisfying neatness and speed, and for which individual blame can be assigned to a clear antagonistic authority, as opposed to the messier and more diffuse global disasters that climate change will continue to accelerate. Um, it was very fashion this is a quote, it was very fashionable for a lot of years that climate change was going to be our end in apocalypse, but all down the line, he'd kept saying nukes, one of Doton's survival, survival, survivors recalls, and nukes it was, nukes to beat the band. But Trump's Sky Alpha is a systems novel in the truest sense, and Trump only its decoy head of state. The bulk of the story is set almost a year after the initial calamity. Some 10% of the Earth's pre-apocalypse pre population survives, although no one knows the number for sure because the internet is now permanently gone. Uh, most survivors live radiation poisoned in dour state-run facilities where they're put to work cataloging, cataloging photographs of the dead or scanning aerial footage collected by drone flying over the ru ruined landscape. Uh, some, we're led to understand, live in informal encampments outside of the purview of the state. But Doton isn't hung up on establishing a post-catastrophic mise-en-scene. Instead, the majority of the text concerns the world that's been lost, specifically the internet and the civilization it's shaped. The novel's protagonist is a former, former tech journalist named Rachel, who, grieving the deaths of her wife and daughter, ambivalently accepts a writing assignment from the soon-to-be relaunched New York Times magazine. <laughs> this is a, a, a parenthetical. After the apocalypse, I was pleased to learn, um, journalism will limp along. Also, everyone is queer. <laughs> Her mission is to document, quote, internet humor at the end of the world. That is the jokes and memes that users post on social media as they realize that humanity, and with it the internet, faced imminent collapse. In the process of this reportage, Rachel uncovers <coughs> clues about the actors behind the internet's initial shutdown, eventually stumbling upon a hacktivist organization whose ideology unfolds obliquely across a patchwork of social media detritus and online consp conspiracy theories, flashbacks, a dizzying 70-page polemic, about the history of the internet, replete with citations of cybernetic theory, and a novel within a novel about the internet as a colonial power. I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay, great. So we're start with Sarah, who's going to give us um, some details uh, about uh, trying to make it as a writer and um, someone who post-Brown who has to make a living and, um, 
anything else that you can think of? What's, what are some of the obstacles and what are some of the positives? And, uh, I was waiting for the some, positives, yeah. You said you had some uh, practical things. Yeah, to yeah. So, go ahead. Um, so I think the, the first thing is that quite obviously, like, I don't write professionally in a creative sense. Um, and I think the biggest, I think it might be helpful for me to do, like, a bit of a trajectory thing. So I actually interned um, at studio in college. And then when I was out of college, I was like, okay, I don't know what comes next. Um, I think it's a challenging thing about Brown's nonfiction program is that it's not a pre-professional program per se in terms of the way we think about it um, just by that definition. But I think that about mid midway when you're a junior, you start thinking very much like you want to be a writer, you want to work in a magazine, you want to um, publish novels. And so I think it's a challenge of the program is that the sort of professional development in terms of the practicals of like, how do you finance that? How do you finance a creative career? How do you get an agent? How do you make those networks? Um, I don't think that there is as much space for it necessarily. Um, and that's something that I definitely grappled with as a senior because I threw myself into my thesis and then was like, oh, jobs. Oh. Um, and so I applied to studio for their apprenticeship program. Um, and the way apprenticeships work in the theater industry, and I can't speak to them um, in the literary industry, but apprenticeships are, you get a very, very small stipend. Um, last year, I was making 280 every two weeks. Um, and you also get free housing at studio. And so that's the way that you can make it work is that they give you free housing. It was 20 minutes from the theater, so I could walk into work every day. Um, it was also right by Trader Joe's, so you could meal prep for $20 a week of groceries. Um, and the another sort of practical reality for me making that choice is that I grew up um, growing. To, I went to high school in D.C. I grew up just outside the area. Um, so it was really like a financial choice that I was like, okay, I know I will – basically not make money for a year. I will be able to survive. I will have housing. I will have food. Um, and I will really invest in a year of sort of professional development writ large. Um, so I spent a year in studio's development department learning, like, the basics of fundraising. And everyone is really excited about this. Um, but fundraising sort of writ large and looking at grants and events and um, how do you, in a really authentic way, um, connect people with the programming that you're doing. So Studio um, is, a, is like a mid-sized theater. Um, and we've actually have produced some sort of Brown's graduates. So this past season, we did Stephen Levinson's If I Forget. Um, and he is better known for Dear Evan Hansen. Um, we also did Sarah Delap's The Wolves, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist and which Mariel Burt directed here at Brown. Um, and so there's actually like a pretty rich uh, story of us producing people from Brown. Um, but the big thing there is like, how do you convey a story? How do you connect people with it? Um, and while I was there, I was also involved with the theater's uh, harassment task force, which there's a whole other story about nonprofits and sort of how they function with many people who are very um, earnest and committed and also massively overworked. Um, but that was a group of four of us looking at the theater's um, harassment policies, not only about sexual harassment, but sort of harassment writ large, including bullying. Um, I was able to use my Brown research skills and sort of compile a best practices survey, um, drafted various recommendations and sort of an executive summary, um, and went from there. And then end of it, I was hired full time, my current position as a grants coordinator, which has me writing grants every day. Um, and in terms of, I walked through all of that because I, I don't think that we hear, or at least I remember asking questions of like, how do you actually you know, make a living and pay for things you need to pay for? In my case, that involves like a lot of therapy. Um, and I knew that I couldn't uh, make certain sacrifices that I think would be required to sort of start full-time um, writing and pursuing writing the way that I wanted to without first having like a, lo a pretty solid um, financial basis. And so that's something which um, I think I'm, I'm quite passionate really about writers and especially young creatives being able to have conversations about money, about financing, about what financing looks like for grad school options. Um, grants are also a great option there too. Um, and the other thing that I would just sort of add in my like big, I don't know, soapbox pitch kind of, um, is that when you apply for a job, you and after you accept the job, one, never accept the first offer. Negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Um, there are a lot of great resources out there, like askamanager.com. Um, it's really great for figuring out, like, how do you go in with a certain asking amount, and then you can work within a range. Um, I also like the podcasts uh, Control Alt Delete and Women Who. They're both sort of like creative entrepreneurial podcasts that get into the like nitty gritty of how do you find how do you finance yourself if you're a freelancer? Um, how do you sort of set yourself up with a creative network? They're both really great. Um, 
but once you accept that and if you negotiate it, and if you are somebody who needs um, disability accommodations for any reason, and that can cover a sort of a huge swath of it, um, the American with Disabilities Act, or Americans with Disabilities Act, it means that any organization is legally required to provide you with reasonable accommodations for whatever you need. And that's something that I didn't know about. So it meant that I was looking at jobs going like, oh my God, how do I like tell them about the therapy thing and how do I work therapy into you know a nine to five? Um, and sort of more practically, what I've realized has come out of that is going, okay, well, when you're interviewing with a company, you can say, like, what is your remote schedule like? What is your culture around flexible work hours? Um, I especially think that since I imagine many of you are interested in working in creative industries, it, I don't think that it will be as much of a, like, oh, we don't do, you know, flexible schedules. Um, but that is definitely a question that you can have when you're interviewing, and it doesn't, like, tip your hand in any way. I think it's very much a reality of modern work, which is that we're the millennial generation. We can sort of work wherever, um, depending, of course, on, on the job. And so that's something which, I don't know, it's, it's tough to come in and be like the person who also is not a writer and who lives in DC and writes grants and is like, there are you know, legal things that you can do. Because I feel like I should offer something like more fun and, and energetic than that. But I, I will say that I think it's, it's one of the questions I had leaving Brown was, um, I felt like a lot of the campus conversation about mental health and about mental illness was like, it's over here, and then your life is here. Um, and in my experience, and with the people that I know who have um, sort of chronic mental illness or mental illness of any kind, it's like, it's your life. There's not anything different about it. It's sometimes it can be really mundane, like you have to do just basic things to get through the day. Um, and people don't talk about that. And so it feels like it's this really big sort of massive pressure that you have to hide. Um, and I think that just being able to bring those two things together um, is a continuing challenge for me, um, I think, as it is for many people. And I also think that it makes your work better because it means that you're more connected as a person. Um, and I think that in the end, like, that's why we all write, kind of. It's like, it's that interest of connection and, or maybe it's also about Cardi B. I don't know, like, Cardi B is also about connection, so, like, there's a <laughs> lot there. Um, but, yeah, that's my, yeah, that's, that's my soapbox. Yeah. yeah, okay, we'll ask the questions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, your trajectory, you have a longer one than for 13 years. So. I love how you keep saying I love that. You keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Getting older. Uh, so, you, I, know, I remember you didn't go to Iowa right away, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the Iowa writing program. You were out for a couple of years. So, tell, give us just, you know, how you. And then what's happening now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, maybe, maybe what will be helpful is I can kind of talk about my trajectory just briefly so people know what they could ask about usefully during Q&A, okay, and then yeah. I could focus on talking about MFA. Does that okay. seem useful? Um, so yeah, I give you an idea of the kind of student I was here. Uh, I hadn't ever heard of an MFA until my final year, my senior year. I was just a total doofus. Uh, <laughs> And so I ended up waiting tables uh, for a year after college and applying desperately to, to MFA programs. Um, because if you've ever waited tables, you know, it's like full of people who are planning to do something. Uh, and I was like, oh my god. And yeah, so I ended up out in Iowa. I spent three years there, then was very lucky and got a fellowship to stay around for another year um, and teach and, and write more. And then got another fellowship and went to teach and work at the University of Louisville. And then decided I really uh, wanted to go to Argentina because I, I loved the writers from Argentina and moved to Buenos Aires, which turned out to be probably a pretty poor idea. Uh, we can talk more about that if you want. Uh, yeah, yeah. It now feels like a premonition of what's happened in the United States. Like when I was in Argentina, it was very much um, at a point where, where their news was just fracturing into two sides and you could not, you had no real sense of what was true anymore. Um, and then I came back, I moved to New York, worked for a nonprofit there. And from the time, uh, this was my thesis project uh, as an MFA student. So I was working on this for about six years straight I sent it off uh, in 2015, like October 15th, 2015, to my agent, like a finished manuscript, and 
like 15 minutes later, they had solved this case, with, case which had un, up till then been unsolved. Um, <laughs> and they were literally digging up a body. Uh, so I had to rewrite the whole freaking thing. <laughs> and yeah, and then you know went through the process of, of like taking this book to market and then having it come out, you know, going through edits, having it come out, doing like a book tour, uh, and like trying to place pieces around publication, all that kind of stuff. And now I'm in the process of, of trying to sell another book just uh, on proposal, which is a whole different kind of uh, ball game, which you have some experience with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so to, I guess, is it useful for me to talk about MFA? Does that, that seem? Yes. And, okay. Because um, I've got a, a small spiel on that, I think. <laughs> Basically, I mean, my, my thoughts are, Primarily, it's just time to work. Um, and you should approach it with that in mind. The, the counsel that I give people thinking about it is uh, I s encourage you to strongly take into account the financial aspect, <laughs> um, particularly if they are not giving you funding to really think hard about that. Um, it is not the kind of thing where it makes sense to come out of it with more debt than you probably already have. Um, and then the second thing I really encourage is to try and go someplace where they will give you the opportunity to teach. I found that to be the most instructive and the most useful thing I got out of my MFA, far and away above uh, taking my own courses. You know, it's one thing to, to read and to write on your own or to go into a class with like a really great writer, but to sit down with 20 students and have to guide them through like a really dense text on your own is a whole different kind of reading. Uh, so if you have that opportunity, take it. And it also means you'll have much better prospects of getting hired afterwards if you're trying to go the academic route. Um, and then the other big thing I would say is, you know, to take into account when you're considering an MFA, is it's, I'm bad at it, and I, I hate this term, but it is like a networking opportunity. You know, these are folks who are interested in the same thing that you're interested in and are uh, going to try, try to be going out of the world along with you. And they can become indispensable allies, both, you know, both in, terms of, in very practical terms and also like in emotional terms. Um, just today before this, I met a friend of mine who lives in Providence now who is in my MFA program, and we kind of just you know, uh, griped. Uh, and those are really important people to have. Yeah. Yeah, that's key. Uh, and yeah, the other thing I guess I would say is that a lot of uh, I felt very fortunate my MFA program was three years, and then I had another year, and I still couldn't finish a damn book in that time. Uh, it's really hard to get something done in that amount of time, uh, especially like a book-length project. And a lot, of, a lot of programs are just two years. Uh, so be realistic if you go into one. Don't, don't expect they're going to come out like an instant success. Um, even if you are able to finish a book in that amount of time, it'll still be like two or three years before it comes out, most likely. <laughs> Uh, so be thinking about what you'll do next in that situation. Um, and yeah, you've really got to be on like applying for fellowships and things like that, uh, which I'm poor at, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I could tell you about, about being an idiot in that respect too. Okay, we'll ask you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Jessica. Uh, tell us about your trajectory. You've done media stuff as well. Right? I have. So, yeah. um, okay. So um, there's actually, I was thinking about this as you were talking about MFA, when, right when I was graduating from college, or a couple years after, there was an essay in M plus one actually called NYC versus MFA. And I highly recommend you guys read it if you haven't yet. If people are nodding, people have read this thing. And um, I took the NYC route. Um, I did not get an MFA. And I can tell you a little bit how that happened. Um, I graduated from Brown and I, my then boyfriend, um, now husband, had a, had a really sweet fellowship to travel, and he said, come. And I was like, okay. Um, and so we went to South America, and in South America, my rent was $25 a month, and there I wrote a couple articles for The Nation. And I, my, the editor, um, I pitched them, and it was like I had I had very little financial responsibility, and I got in touch with the the editor. liked me, and she said, "You know, when you if you come back to New York, you should apply for our internships." 
And so I applied to the internship and I got an internship there. And the woman who was the head of the internship program had a boyfriend who was a fact checker at the New Yorker. And there was an opening as the, in the fact checking department in the New Yorker and they needed someone who spoke Spanish and I happened to be fluent in Spanish. And I applied and I got to be a fact checker at the New Yorker. And I, um, all of this makes me, and then I was, have kind of gone between jobs in the media ever since. So I was a fact checker at the New Yorker, and then I was an editor, um, at Al Jazeera America, and I was doing research for a filmmaker and screenwriter named Mark Boll, who wrote um, Zero Dark Thirty and The Hurt Locker. And when he started a production company, he asked me to come on full time, and so I worked for him as a story editor and producer. And then um, we ended up partnering with Serial um, to the second season of Serial. So then I went on loan to Serial um, for a year and a half, which was great because I had done radio in college and had missed that. And after I did Serial, sort of the world of broadcasts got opened up to me. And I worked as a supervising producer at Vice News Tonight on HBO. I oversaw their features programs. And then um, that I decided to leave that job because that was a very full-time job and I needed more time for writing. So I took a part-time job at Gimlet Media, which is podcasting. And I was editing a lot of their podcasts there. Um, so that's my trajectory, but the thing you might have not heard much in that story is writing. Um, and the truth is, is the NYC trajectory um, gave me a lot of financial stability, it gave me a lot of connections, it made me have to write on nights and weekends and mornings, and um, there's an advantage and disadvantage to taking that route. I think that I've spent a lot of my <coughs> career to date um, helping people do the kind of work I, I, would, ide I would ideally do. Um, it made, I learned a lot in the process. I think there is also something a little bit, if I'm being totally honest, um, a little soul crushing about being the supporter of work that you secretly want to be doing. Um, and there were times I envied friends of mine who just sort of like um, went off into the world and prioritized their own work. But that said, I still got the work done. Um, like I... Um, wrote a book, I've written a lot of magazine stories, I like still make, t I've written a screenplay that's like kind of out in the world right now and I can talk a little about that. Um, and so yeah, I mean and at this point in my life, I'm, I'm an old, as Catherine has made very, very clear. Um, You've been out of here for 13 <laughs> 13 years. 13 years. Um, um, <laughs> Um, and just now, I'm, I'm 34, and that's now I'm now a full-time writer, and it's taken me this long to be able to do that. And, um, and a lot of, and that's, I'm also able to do it because I have a bunch of skills that I know I can always fall back on if the writing isn't going as well financially. And um, I don't know, I, there were, and that's been my path. It's a path that I would say that... Um, I mean, I, I'm gonna, I don't want to be an old, but I'm just about to say something so old, um, which is like, you, when, you, if you, you could be, should be gentle with yourself when you graduate from college. It's okay if your book doesn't come out before you turn 30. Um, it feels okay that I'm like a full-time writer now at 34 and that it took me a while to get here. I've done cool things along the way. I've learned a lot. Um, and so the NYC route, I would say, yeah, it's like, it's a, it's sort of practical and it's sort of impractical. You're sort of like almost prioritizing the day job more than the dream job sometimes. Um, but then at the same time, the day job is kind of much closer to the dream job than I would say some of my friends who sort of took the MFA route. Um, so yeah, I and mean, we can talk much more about all of that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then my book, I, do you want to, we can get into like, how does one publish a book on proposal? We can talk about that later. Yes, on, on questions about how do you get an agent, yeah. how do you do pitching, for example, would be helpful. But let's, let's yeah. hear from Lisa and then folks can <coughs> ask, um, ask questions. Those, yeah. those are ones that I would want to look at. Sure. Lisa. Um, yeah, I was just, I was thinking when you guys were talking, um, in, the, in the book that emerged out of the MFA versus NYC article, there's mm -hmm. like a, another article um, by Keith Gessen where he talks about how like if, if you want to work in or like adjacent to writing prior to like getting a book deal there's like basically four options and one is to have inherited wealth um, yeah. and one is to get an MFA and one is to like be a journalist and then the fourth is to like do odd jobs in publishing um, 
And I would say that that last thing is like definitely what I've been up to. Um, so like, I guess my trajectory is, um, I graduated in December of last year, in like 2017.5. Um, and then, which is like a really convenient time to graduate because I like, I had no plan. So I went home, I went to my parents' house, and I was like, I'm here for Christmas. And they were like, are you sure you're not here forever? <laughs> um, which was a real worry. But, um, but then I moved to New York and had this kind of like stressful spring of, um, I was interning at N plus one, which was really fun. And then like cobbling together all these freelancey things. Like um, I found on Craigslist like a tutoring job, um, which was like, I felt kind of like, uh, morally compromised about, you know, it's not a very like, I was like fact checking these articles about socialism during the day and then in the afternoon like helping rich kids get into college. Um, so that was kind of weird, but also fun um, and ni nice to practice pedagogy, I guess. Um, and was working as like a research assistant for a film critic and doing like a number of kind of freelance fact checking um, gigs that I, that I sort of found through people I knew. Um, so that was really stressful, um, but also really fun. And, and, and interning at NPLUS One was really fun. And then I um, applied to this job at the New Republic as a reporter researcher. That's kind of, I feel like there's not a ton of, of like established entry level um, journalism-y type positions. I think the Nation one is really great. Mm -hmm. And this reporter researcher one is really good. Um, but I applied to that job and was and in interviewed for it. Um, and they were like, why do you want to be a journalist? And I was like, I don't want to be a journalist. <laughs> oh no! Um, but I mentioned in this interview that I was really interested in typesetting and production, which was something that I'd learned a little bit about at N plus one. And they were like, "We need a person to do that right now." So they hired me for this other job that I like never applied to, um, which was great and super lucky. And and I think a nice reminder that in a job interview you should just like throw out things you're interested in. Um, so I worked as their like production manager and typesetter for a while, um, which was super fun and like a whole kind of set of skills that I didn't really have, but, but was lucky to be able to like learn on the job. Um, so now I know InDesign, which is great. Um, and then I uh, started working at Unplus One like a month ago. They needed someone to do their, their like marketing and publicity. Um, uh, but yeah, I've been there for like 10 minutes, so I don't have terribly much to say, but it's a great, Unplus One's the best. Um, and it's been really, uh, <coughs> It's been really fun to work on a, on a very tiny staff. I feel like the, my main takeaway so far has just been figuring out how to be really responsive to the needs of like three other people that I'm in an office with. Um, and sometimes that means like making a spreadsheet that someone wants, and sometimes it means not being chatty if someone is you know, annoyed or something. Um, but uh, yeah, that's been my, my path so far. Yeah. So Quickly tell us about the Nation publication. What did you do to get that? Did you pitch, did you pitch that to the Nation on the book review? Mm. How is that? It was kind of funny. They actually reached out to me about it. Um, I met at a Christmas party. I met um, their literary editor, and we had like a sort of like a drunk conversation about novels about Twitter. Um, <laughs> and I like mentioned this book that was coming out that I knew about. Um, and then his assistant emailed me a few weeks later and was like, you should write about this, which was great. Um, but I think that, uh, I, I'm like a very shy, I'm very shy about pitching and haven't published very much since graduating. Um, and I think that's not the kind of thing that I should like depend on happening. Um, but it was sweet. Um, but yeah, I have, I've pitched like a couple of places. Um, I pitched a couple things to Bomb, the arts magazine, and, and published some stuff on their website. Um, and have like also unsuccessfully pitched to a couple of places too. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's hear questions from you folks. Um, testing, testing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I can hand this microphone to anybody who has a good question or a bad question. <laughs> There's someone right behind you. Thank you. Hopefully, it's a good question. Um, I think this would probably most directly relate to Cutter. Um, you mentioned a little bit about like while you were at Iowa teaching and having the opportunity to get into that and that helping later on. Um, while looking at MFA programs, it's kind of been like, do I go the academic route or do I go the academic route? Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about like choosing to, to teach 
after your MFA and choosing to go this route and and um, sort of what I've heard about it from like professors is usually like for every one professorial job there is there are a thousand people applying for it and that it's like a very difficult thing to do, like to sort of break into um, so I'd love to hear more about that sure um, yeah I mean <clears throat> yes you're correct I think it is very difficult um, it's also something I'm not doing it now so I'm not the best person to talk to about it but yeah I mean there are uh, this friend who I just met before here was, that was a big part of what he was griping about. <laughs> uh, and he has, he has a great academic position, but would like a better one. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's a real thing to consider when you're applying to MFA programs because there are way more people than there are jobs. Um, and, uh, you know, your, your pedigree, for lack of a better word, and your publication history are really important. Um, and I think there are a lot of, of, to me, somewhat unethical programs out there, you know, that are, are training people with the plenty of knowledge that they'll never get jobs. So definitely be very careful about that. I think there are other predatory places. Um, but having said that, I don't think it's, that's, always the only avenue. You know, I had students who are now, we, I think we tend to think in very um, limited terms about what your options are after MFA. You know, it does seem like it's just that. But I've had students, one who's now like a really fantastic uh, digital archivist, leading this digital archive prog prog project for a consortium of the Ivies, which is really cool. Um, I have a student who now uh, works at BuzzFeed and is like a stand-up comedian in New York. You know, it's not to say that any of these are like easy lives or reliable paychecks necessarily, uh, but there are definitely lots of opportunities. And I think one of the things that that uh, is also you know out there is that lots of people do do MFA and NYC, <laughs> um, and usually between both of those, you can often kind of build a very strong network of possibilities. Um, in terms of of navigating that, that market after uh, your MFA, like the job market, uh, I'm a really bad person to talk to about it. I, so I got this fellowship after Iowa, which I applied two weeks late for. Um, and I think they just didn't realize. And uh, yeah, so throw it out there just in case. <laughs> but I think you just really need to kind of like paper everything and, and get your name out there. Uh, I wish there was better advice, but it's just, I think it's a matter of like doing a bunch of stuff. So what are you doing now? Just writing, yeah, and trying to. Is, are you supported by a grant for, for writing? Or yes. I, I didn't mention, but you had a, obviously the National Endowment in the Arts uh, grant. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so basically I'm trying to sell another book proposal before that NEA grant and the uh, advance from this one run out. <laughs> <laughs> then that's like a really important thing to mention, I think, you know, the, the knife like isn't always at your throat, but it's somewhere out there. Um, and if you are the kind of person who really needs the, like, the, um, the, what's the word I should look for? I don't know. The uh, stability of like a steady paycheck. Take that in mind when you're considering this path. Uh, I also have the good fortune to be married to someone with a uh, a steady job, which helps like even the lumps out. Um, so do that if you can. <laughs> true. That's yeah. one of the things that you didn't mention, but a number of our alums have, have done that. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then you have to be very nice to them. <laughs> um, no, it's true. I mean, it's, it, uh, and maybe this is a weird direction to go on this. <laughs> but no, this lifestyle has an effect on the other people in your lives, and that's important to take into account, too. Um, and it's worth like being clear with those people about what you're trying to do and, and uh, having a lot of very sober conversations and drunken conversations um, about it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a strange life, but I think ultimately it can be a very like, rewarding and fun one. Uh, and it does feel very... Uh, weird and special, all of these little
parts of it. You know, I, like I just got the, the paperbacks in the mail for my book um, out of nowhere. Nobody told me they were coming. Uh, and what a like, strange, delightful experience to just have that in your mail one day. And they keep sending me the audiobook over and over again. I've gotten, <laughs> I've gotten five packages of like enormous CD packs. Um, if you want an audiobook, come see me. <laughs> I'm just wondering, and please get as granular as possible with your answer, uh, how you manage to write a book while having a day job, or like what that process of the research and the writing, where you saw it in and stuff like that. Sure. Um, how did I do that? Um, <laughs> the, the, um, let's see. So I, when I, the first time, so the, the idea for the book came while I was working at The New Yorker, and one of the things I was doing there was I was writing some of the anonymous book reviews at the back of the magazine, briefly noted, if you've ever seen those. And um, it's, um, I was, yeah, so I was writing those, and so the way those worked is that you, um, if there was a book coming out that you wanted to review, you would tell the editor, and I told the editor that I was sort of interested in reviewing Cheryl Strayed's Tiny Beautiful Things, and the editor, who's a man I really admire, he was like, we're not going to review an advice book, like, that's not what we do, and I was like, that's weird, that's going to be a bestseller, like, what's going on? And so I ended up writing a sort of longish story for the New Yorker's website about Cheryl Strayed and the history of advice and the sort of weird place these advice givers have in our lives about like where they have all this sort of cultural power but also aren't really taken seriously at the same time and like who are these people who receive all of our emotional needs and um, who we need in our lives and a lot of people depend on but yet are kind of a joke at the same time so I wrote that piece and that piece did pretty it was online and it it did well um, which in like internet writing speak means like a lot of people clicked on it. And, um, and I had an idea for a book after that. And um, around that time I got an agent and I told him that I had an idea for a book and he was like, write a book proposal. And by the time all that happened, I was at Al Jazeera America and I was editing feature stories for their website. And I was, ha I was writing a book proposal um, you know what, actually, no, I had a month between when I took the job at Al Jazeera and when I quit the job at the New Yorker, and I did a lot of the book proposal writing during that month. And then I was editing it a bunch during the, um, while I was at Al Jazeera, and I would edit it in the mornings before work. Um, and then I would take a few hours on Saturday and Sunday and, and work on my book proposal while I was there. And um, all, my husband was very understanding of this, which is really good. Um, and then I was at, um, I'm pointing at Cutter as if he's my husband. I <laughs> but I know him, and he's great. He's, he's great. great. Yeah, not to confuse things. Um, but, um, sorry. Um, so I. I love that idea. They were like supporting each other, but not mentioning like, it. Because you knew what I was saying. But anyway, for those, um, anyway. Um, I work in audio so often, so I'm just like, if people were just hearing this, this would be confusing, um, or just seeing this. Um, so yeah, so I was doing it on uh, nights and weekends, and then I, um, I left the job at Al Jazeera to take that job at the production company with Mark Bull. And the nice thing about the job with Mark Bull was that he lived in LA, and so though it was a full-time job, I had a lot of flexibility in terms of when I worked and um, how I did it. And so, I got the book deal, and for the first year of my book deal, I was just doing it when, like, often I was working in the mornings because of the time difference between New York and LA. Like, those, the mornings were sort of my time. Um, and so I did that, and then when Serial started happening, I kind of had to put the book down because I was just really, really busy producing that season. And then after Serial happened, I got the job at Vice News Tonight on HBO. And there, I just had a really lovely, generous boss who gave me a paid book leave. Mm. And I finished the book while on paid book leave. So I was working after eight months at the job. He gave me um, eight weeks to, um, to finish my book. And that's how I did it. So that's as granular, that's as, granular as I can get. Um, and then I was doing sort of copy edits and proofreads while, like, again, nights and weekends while I was at Vice. How many years did it take to write a book? Approximately, just. Um, th 
Well, I'm gonna count from when I got my book deal to when it came out, it was about three and a half years. Yeah. That's good. Could you tell us about getting an agent? How, you, how one goes about doing that? You both mentioned you got agents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> Nicely played. Um, how did I get my agent? I got my agent, I wrote an article. Um, I had written a bunch of articles, and uh, a very kind man reached out to me and said, are you represented? And wow. yeah, <laughs> and that's how I got my agent. Before that, I, was, um, I really wanted an agent because I um, had an idea for a book. And um, like I started just emailing agents, hoping that they would pay attention to me. And that did not work out at all. <laughs> and then here it was, like a, a, like a magic email appeared one day. And he was my, yeah. And he worked at Inkwell, which was an, a big agency. And um, that, that, were, that was lovely. So. <laughs> yeah, so I just um, asked people I knew who their agents were. <laughs> And then emailed them, being like, hey, I know so-and-so. Want to be my agent. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, to mixed, mixed effect. But I talked to a few folks. Uh, I ended up meeting somebody who was really uh, nice. Uh, my agent is this guy, PJ Market, at Janklo and Nesbitt, um, who's been very kind and thoughtful and giving with his time and, and seemed to be kind of on the same page as I was. Um, and yeah, that's that was about it. Is I mean, stressful. The agent Carter, or, or the yeah. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Uh, the finding or the what part? Finding. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Totally. I mean, you're. Yeah. It's all stressful. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess. Um, yeah. I mean, it's. I think the important thing is is that um, somebody. What somebody told me as I was going through this process was that. It's weirdly, having an agent is weirdly like um, a relationship. I feel like I'm, I'm, despite the fact that Jess wrote a book about relationship advice, I'm giving you a lot of relationship advice today. Um, yeah, it, it's, you are in this, you're kind of binding your futures together, you know, and, and uh, they're making money off of you and you're reliant on them for their connections. Uh, so it's this really strange relationship and you wanna have somebody that you feel you can have uh, very straightforward conversations with and whose opinion you trust. You know, you don't want to be um, misled into a bad deal and you want to make sure that they're going to be there for you. And the other important thing I think to keep in mind, uh, which is something that somebody actually, uh, a former Brown classmate told me and which is so smart and I never would have put it together myself, is that, you know, an agent spends a lifetime building relationships with important editors at important publishing houses. And the last thing they want to do is destroy those relationships for you, <laughs> right? Um, so those are their primary relationships, and you are their secondary relationship. Uh, so you just have to be kind of very careful of thinking about that and like reading between the lines on what's going on in these negotiations when you are taking your book out to a bunch of, of um, publishers. Uh, and yeah, you know, you just have to be kind of savvy. And, and that's where it helps, like I said, to have developed those friendships with people who have been through this kind of stuff so you can consult with them as well and, and see what makes sense. Um, because that part of the process, I would say, is extremely nerve wracking mm -hmm. when suddenly your book is sitting on the desks of like 30 different publishers and they're all trying to decide whether or not it's worth it to plunk down a bunch of money for it. Mm -hmm. Somebody else have a, have a question? Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, this is a very broad question, but how would you say your perception, or sorry, your relationship to your writing has evolved and changed, like, you know, since college and also, um, I guess, for <laughs> like, since, like, when you first started out, this is, like, you know, but, like, fair. <laughs> You all have been talking a lot, so I think you mm -hmm. should. I think so, first. too. <laughs> um, well, to take it really back, I think my first, the first published piece I had was a really well-received thing on fanfiction.net. Um, <laughs> yeah. I made a hundred people cry, wow. which is, like, my favorite thing about myself. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think that since, I don't know, I, I think that Brown, as I 
I imagine many of you feel now, Brown is a bit of a pressure cooker um, for reasons which I think can be true and for reasons that um, sometimes feel a bit artificially created by the infrastructure of this place. Um, and I think that although being outside of Brown also comes with its own pressure, um, and Cutter and I were talking about nonprofit worlds and how they're a whole other thing, um, I think that being outside of Brown, and in some ways, quite honestly, being outside of the like NYC MFA question, um, has made me get a bit out of the bubble, I think, that a lot of writing communities can be in. Um, I, I, I'm listening and hearing, I think, so much really strong advice and, and wisdom, and it's also so different from my experience. Where, like, I live in DC, um, and there's a huge creative economy. Like, that's actually one of the biggest things that the DC government is trying to do. Um, so there's like a big cultural plan and whatnot. And so I, I think not doing writing just in a, I'm a writer and I'm writing pieces, but actually like I'm learning city policy as part of my job. Um, I'm learning a lot of people management skills because I work in a nonprofit with 34 people and it's a theater, so there are a lot of personalities there. Um, you know, I'm very loyal to my Google Calendar, um, work and personal. So it's, I know, I think in some ways being outside of Brown and learning a lot of just like basic professional skills, and that's not a writing question, so I think I'm sort of shifting away from it a bit. That's been so helpful for me because it means that when I go back to my writing, I'm not like, oh my God, this is the only thing that gives me meaning. This is how I know myself to be true. It's like, oh, like I was able to sit through that meeting and you know, be cogent and clear and get that done. And that means that when I leave work and I sit down to writing, I'm like, oh, I actually have two hours that I can actually focus on this as opposed to, I remember there's so many times writing my thesis, I just sit down in T-Lux and be like, oh my God, I need to write like the best words about Ben Affleck's back tattoo. It was a whole thing. You um, did do that. I did. Yeah. You wrote the best words um, about it. <laughs> Nobody else has done it yet, so that's the thing. Um, but I don't. I think that honestly, the the outside perspective and the space just to develop skills, and that's the big thing. I think like if you're looking at a job and it's not a writing job, think about the skills you want to develop, um, because those will always be applicable regardless of where you are. Um, and I think that it, in my case at least, it's given me a perspective and an appreciation for what writing is that I didn't have when I think I was so sort of nose to nose with it here at Brown. Yeah. Do you want to say, add to that? <coughs> um, yeah, that's... How, would you, how have you changed? Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. I feel like I haven't been doing terribly much writing after college in, in the way that I, that I was in college. Um, but I do feel like I've, I've taken a lot of the the energy that I, you know, at like one point put into writing papers or like indie articles or whatever, um, and stuck it into like writing really good emails or like, I don't know. There's like all, there's so many things you can write or like making beautiful spreadsheets. Um, mm. These are all like you know things you can do with with the the brain space that that like that writing can be one container for. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I've also had I feel like all my jobs have involved a lot of reading, much more reading than writing. Um, but but very different kinds of reading, um, and and I think this is this to me is like the through line of my cobbled together career so far is like that um, you know when you're when you're typesetting an article um, that's one kind of reading you know, you're reading for like bad breaks and um, loose lines and things like that and, uh, and and proofreading is a different kind of reading and fact checking involves a whole other kind of reading um, and like proofreading an article and then posting it on Twitter is like another kind of reading too, and another kind of writing. Um, I don't know, I think, I, I think my relationship to writing has maybe become more, more like capacious and probably less mm -hmm. precious. Um, That's good. That's good. Anyone have a question? This might be too similar to that question, but yeah. I, for everyone, I'm just curious if you were a junior or a sophomore in the audience and you could do differently or again uh, knowing now what you knew then, what, what would you do to prep for life after Brown? Um. Mm, so much. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I mean, honestly, I think I would have just, if I, I just would have told myself to not be in such a rush. That's probably like the number one thing I would. Do. I like. I graduated from college, and I think um, I was just like, oh, like I have to be a writer now. Like mm -hmm. it was just, and it was, um, and like what you were saying about 
you know, three years isn't that long of a time to write a book, and three years isn't that long to be out of school. Like, um, you know, there's a lot of the, like, Browns, it was an incredible experience for me. It's, like, the first time I'm back since, like, my first year reunion. And I'd, I really, like, I loved it here. But it's, it, it, there's a lot to see outside the world. And it's, like, take some time and see it before you start writing things down. Um, I'm, like, I did a, I, I've largely been a journalist. And it, it's been great to get to travel. It's been great to to like see worlds outside of it like I'm and working in an office whether it was like as a it, it was just like I got to see different people got to see how they worked you know um yeah I think that would be my biggest advice like just don't rush like you'll get there mm-hmm. um, and I, yeah I was in such a rush to publish when I was um coming out and um you know like it, it's there's no there's no reason to rush I think I came up with one. I think, I think <laughs> like a concrete, easy to wrap your mind around one. Um, I just, I wish actually that I had been a little bit more involved in the, the general writing community at Brown. Like I took a lot of writing courses, something I really cared about. Um, but, and I, I also made a lot of friends, but I didn't feel like, uh, you know, like I never got involved in like the Brown Daily Herald or anything like that. And I kind of, uh, I regret not having done that. I feel like that would have been um, really helpful for me to have kind of built a lot of those relationships based in love of writing then. I did eventually get that in grad school, and that's part of what I think made that really important for me. Uh, But I wish I'd I'd started doing that work a lot earlier. That's funny. I feel like, um, I feel like I almost, I don't know, I was very involved in the College Hill Independent, which was amazing, and I, I like I love the indie forever, um, but I also kind of wish that I had like thought of writing like um, like a little bit less socially um, and more as like a potential, a potential instrument. Like I wish I'd done more organizing in college, um, mm. and th- I don't even know how much that has to do with writing, but I do wish I had done that. And I feel like my relationship <coughs> with like publishing right now also feels very social in a way that is like sometimes kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But I, I wish that I'd started earlier, like, thinking about writing as something that I could do as, like, divorced from social mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I That's think, a great point. Yeah, one theme that I'm hearing is um, let yourself be curious. I know I was, always, like, I always wanted to be right. I wanted, to, I wanted things to be perfect, and that meant, you know, not, not curious. And I think, you know, if it does mean, like, you want to join a different organization or, or join a different campus group, like... I think that following where you are interested in, where you are now, is so important um, because that can lead you to the people, um, that can lead you to the next thing that you're interested in. And I think that um, Brown is so great at pulling in young people um, who are so interested in a variety of different things. And I feel like sometimes that ethos gets lost a bit when we're all sort of heads down. Um, And I think that your curiosity can be like your greatest asset. Um, I think it's important to remember that. I think it's really important just to use this time like that, and that's how you're going to set yourself up for success after after Brown, really. The the other thing I would also suggest doing in terms of right now is um, start trading work with your friends and editing each other, mm-hmm. um, because it's a really great thing to get into the habit of doing that with your like your writer friends. I still do it with my writer friends. It's a really nice thing to do. It'll also teach you how to edit, and editing is a really great skill to have, um, and it's a really like. I found like a lot of my friends over the, like their years as a writer have learned that they prefer editing to writing or writing to editing, and it's hard to learn to edit. Like it's like you, there's no class in it. Like it's not something um, you really can learn how to do until you get a job doing it. And so I would start trading papers. Like just do it and sort of see how you enjoy that, and it'll make you a better writer editing other people. It'll make you a better colleague to your friends that you meet now and who could very well be your colleagues and collaborators for many more years. Um, that, would be, that would be a suggestion I have. Okay, well, why don't you come and just say hello? <laughs> and thank you very much. Yeah.